So uh, I'm going to talk today about how we can improve economic opportunity in Oregon and what we can learn from work we're doing in our research group using big data here at Harvard. But I want to start at a much bigger picture level by talking about the American dream, which of course is a complicated, multifaceted concept that means different things to different people. But let's distill it to a simple statistic that we can measure systematically in the data, which is a traditional way of thinking about the American dream, the idea that through hard work, any child in America should have the chance of going on to earn more than their parents did of achieving a higher living standard. And so in this chart that you see on the screen here, we're asking the extent to which America actually lives up to that ideal. And as you can see, for kids born in the 1940s, it was a virtual guarantee that you were going to achieve the American dream of going on to earn more than your parents. What we're plotting here is just a fraction of kids who went on to earn more than their parents did based on the year in which they were born. And so in 1940, that number was 92%. 92% of kids in their mid-30s earned more than their parents did when they were 30, adjusting for inflation. Now, if you look at how this has evolved over time, you see a very striking and dramatic pattern, which is simply that the American dream has faded for most people. For kids born in the 1980s, it's now only a coin flip as to whether you'll achieve the American dream of moving up relative to your parents. 50% of kids born in 1984 went on to earn more than their parents did. So motivated by this broad trend, in our research group, Opportunity Insights, we're focused on the big question of how can we restore the American dream. And so our approach really involves three central elements. First, we use big data to study how to increase upward mobility. So you all hear all the time now about big data being used by companies like Amazon and Google to improve the products they offer. Our vision is analogously such data can be used to tackle important public policy questions, such as increasing social mobility in the US. Second, rather than focusing on any one set of policy approaches, we analyze a broad range of interventions, organizing our analysis more in the form of the life course, looking at interventions from birth to adulthood, from schools to housing policy to changes in social capital. Third, in order to take that big problem and that wide variety of approaches and distill it to something that can actually make a difference and make progress, we focus on studying the roots of the problems we're analyzing locally in order to develop tailored solutions. So looking, as I will show you, within Oregon, within parts of Portland, within different counties in the state, and so forth. Now, in organizing our approach, we find it useful to think in analogy to familiar ideas in medicine, where you'd think about a diagnosis phase, a treatment phase, and a follow-up or evaluation phase. And so analogously, when you're thinking about issues of upward mobility, we think you can proceed in, in a similar process, starting with an assessment phase, where we focus on identifying the areas where opportunity is lacking, followed by developing a set of policy pilots, interventions on the ground, working with local stakeholders to design things like changes in affordable housing policies or mentoring programs or other things that I will talk about. Um, and then importantly, evaluating the impacts of what we're doing. Are these policy pilots actually having the intended effect? How can we make them better and so forth, ultimately with the hopes of creating scalable policies to increase upward mobility, not just in the specific communities where we're testing these ideas, but more broadly. Now, the launching off point for a lot of the work that we do and what I will discuss in detail today is something we released just a couple of months ago called the Opportunity Atlas, which is a tool that allows us to measure upward mobility across America using anonymized data from census and tax records covering 20 million kids linked to their parents. So what is unique about these data is that we're able to track kids from birth to adulthood and basically ask what are the circumstances where kids end up doing really well and climbing the income ladder. Now, what I'm gonna show you in the next few slides, we're gonna assign kids to locations based on where they grew up and measure their average incomes at age 35. So for instance, if you grew up in a particular neighborhood in Portland and now you live in a different part of Oregon or you live in New York, you're still gonna be mapped back to that neighborhood in Portland where you grew up. The key innovation of this longitudinal approach where we're following people over time is that, as you will see, it allows, to, allows us to trace the roots of outcomes like poverty or incarceration back to childhood neighborhoods. So rather than asking 
where do high income and low income folks live today, we can ask what are the neighborhoods, what are the specific areas of the country that help people rise up and what are the places where opportunity is less available and how can we then go about to improve opportunity in those places. So let me dive into the data and start by just giving you some national context for what the geography of opportunity looks like in the United States as a whole. So I started out in the very first chart I showed you by showing you the fading American dream at a national level. What this analysis is now showing you is that that story of kids now not having great chances to climb up the income ladder varies greatly around different parts of the United States. So what we're doing in this map is dividing the US into 740 different metro and rural areas assigning kids to those areas based on where they grew up, and calculating the average incomes at age 35 for kids whose parents were at the 25th percentile of the income distribution, that is parents who were earning about $25,000 a year. The map is colored so that blue areas represent areas with higher levels of upward mobility, where kids go on to have higher incomes themselves in adulthood, and red colors represent areas with lower levels of upward mobility. So to start by just looking at the scale, in the lower right uh, corner of the slide. And you can see that there's an incredible range in terms of the outcomes that you see for children growing up in these low-income families. In some places, like in the center of the country, you see that children go on to earn $45,000 a year, starting out in families that were at 25,000. Whereas in other parts of the country, for instance, Charlotte, North Carolina, or much of the Southeast, you see very low levels of upward mobility. Kids are on average earning 27,000, basically the same place on average as where their parents were. Now, if we look at Oregon, you see that even within Oregon, there's quite a bit of variation. Portland, among large cities, looks relatively good at about $34,000 on average. Uh, the eastern parts of the state are in bluer colors, have relatively high levels of upward mobility, but then parts of the state near uh, the west coast have lower levels of upward mobility. Now, we can um, go, go further into this by uh, zooming in to Oregon. And to do that, I'm gonna to switch to this online tool which you can access uh, at opportunityatlas.org. Uh, and this is the same map that I was just showing you before in the slide. But what I'm gonna do now is zoom in to Portland to start um, and show you what this variation looks like at a more local level. So here you can see the data census tract by census tract within Portland. Uh, census tracts, just to give you a sense of scale, there are 70,000 census tracts in America. There are about 4,000 people per census tract. So think of these as very small definitions of neighborhoods. And so what the, the, the first thing that you should be able to see immediately uh, in this map is that the range of colors that you saw in the U.S. as a whole is reflected just within a few miles, even within the city of Portland, right? So if you go to places right here in the north side of the city, places like Humboldt, for example, uh, you see very dark red colors that are comparable to the colors we saw in Charlotte or in Alabama. Uh, and if you go over here to more of the eastern side of the city, uh, to, to, places like, um, uh, to places like Madison South, for example, uh, and other such neighborhoods, uh, Grant Park, uh, you see much higher levels of upward mobility. Um, you know, incomes of something like $40,000 a year, similar to what we were seeing in Iowa or the center of the country. So that shows you, you know, within the city of Portland, very sharp local variation. I want to highlight a couple of other patterns that might be of interest by zooming out a little bit uh, more in the, in the rural parts of the state. So as we were seeing earlier on the national map, um, if you look out here to the eastern uh, side of, of uh, Oregon, uh, and you look, for instance, at Wallowa County or other places in the eastern part of the state, uh, Morrow County here or Wheeler County, you start to see much higher uh, levels of upward mobility than we were seeing even in uh, many parts of Portland, comparable to the highest levels of upward mobility in the U.S. But then if you come down here to Douglas County or some of the parts of the southwestern parts of the state, you see significantly lower levels of upward mobility. People who grew up in low-income families are earning on average $10,000 less than people growing up in the eastern parts of the state. Uh, but again, there's uh, important detail here that you can see uh, if you were to zoom in. Um, so let me just go in a bit closer here. So you can see that even within southwestern Oregon, it's important to disaggregate the data. And so if you look, for instance, at parts of Roseburg or Grants Pass, you know, different areas here in uh, southwestern Oregon, 
you start to again see pretty high levels of upward mobility. So all of this is to say is that even within the state of Oregon, you have some places that you know truly are lands of opportunity for kids growing up in low income families. And there are other places within the state that unfortunately at the present time are not really great in terms of giving chances, kids good chances of climbing up. So let me now return back uh, to the slides and start to get into the key question, which I'm sure is on all of your minds, of what is driving the substantial variation that we're seeing across areas? And ultimately, what can we do from a policy perspective to improve kids' chances of climbing up? So the first thing you might think of, which is very natural, especially from a business perspective, is that this is about the availability of jobs and about industry and so forth. And of course, at some level, that answer has to be right. In order to have people climbing up, you have to have good jobs that they can ultimately reach. However, that's not the answer in and of itself. And you can kind of see that from this national map. If you take a place like Charlotte, North Carolina, for example, many of you will know that Charlotte has had a tremendous amount of job growth in the past 20 or 30 years. Charlotte, by all measures, all traditional economic measures, is viewed as a booming economic success. And so, in fact, if you plot um, rates of upward mobility versus rates of job growth, as you see on this scatter plot here, you, you see Charlotte down here in the lower right as a place with very high rates of job growth. Yet, as you saw on the previous map, Charlotte is in a very dark red color. It has very low rates of upward mobility for kids growing up there. So how does that add up? How do you both have a lot of job growth and wage growth, yet not have a lot of upward mobility? It's because places like Charlotte effectively import a lot of talent. People grow up in other places and move to places like Charlotte or Atlanta to get those high paying jobs. Apparently, the job growth that's occurring in Charlotte is not necessarily benefiting the kids who grow up there. So there's a similar phenomenon at play more broadly nationally, as you see from this chart. There's not a strong link between rates of job growth and rates of upward mobility. So you see Portland here highlighted in red has had relatively high job growth. It's not, you know, uh, it's pretty good in terms of rates of upward mobility on average. But as we saw, there are lots of places within Portland that are, that are below that average. Uh, and so what that shows you, first of all, is that we need to think beyond jobs. We need to think about how we help kids in our communities climb up in addition to providing good jobs. Okay, so uh, turning on from that, uh, given that it's not just about jobs, so why then does upward mobility actually vary across areas? So the first point I want to make in analyzing this question is that most of the variation in upward mobility that we saw in the maps that I just showed you is caused by differences in childhood environment. And the way we establish that finding is by studying 7 million families that move across areas. So rather than getting into the statistical details of that study, I'm going to summarize what we find with a simple example. So let's say you take a set of families that move from Humboldt, which as we saw in the map of Portland is a neighborhood in Portland which has relatively low rates of upward mobility. And on average, kids who grow up from birth in Humboldt in a low income family go on to earn about $22,000 a year in their mid 30s. Now imagine a set of kids whose families move from Humboldt to North Tabor, which is uh, another neighborhood about five miles east of Humboldt, where, which was in a much bluer color, uh, where we saw kids going on to earn much more on average. So what I want you to do is think about a set of families who move from Humboldt to North Tabor with kids of different ages starting with families who move when their child is exactly two years old. And so what you can see from this first dot that's plotted here is that if you track those kids forward, they moved at age two, measure their own earnings when they are 35 years old, and ask how much are they earning on average, the answer is they're earning about $32,000 per year on average. Okay, so that's for the kids who move when they are exactly two. Now let's repeat that analysis for kids who move when they're three, four, five, and so on. And what you see is a very clear pattern. The later you make that move from Humboldt to North Tabor, the less of a gain you get. And if you move by the time you're in your early 20s or after that point, you get essentially no gain at all. The relationship is completely flat. So what are the key takeaways from this chart? First, you can see that where you grow up really matters. It's not just that the people who live in Humboldt are different from the people who live in North Tabor or the people who live in Portland are different from the people who live in Charlotte. Of course they are, but apparently if you take a given child and move that child to a bluer colored part of the map, 
you see really different outcomes for that child. And so that, in my view, is a very encouraging result because it shows that the big problem of the fading American dream and declining social mobility is totally changeable. In fact, it's changeable even at the range of five miles within a city. And so that, I think, should be very encouraging for all of us. It's simply a matter of figuring out why do we see such different outcomes in different places and how can we replicate that success more broadly. Second, what you can see here is that what really seems to be important is childhood environment rather than conditions in adulthood. Moving as a kid makes a big difference. Moving when you're an adult doesn't matter a whole lot. Third, you can see that every extra year of exposure to a better childhood environment, if you move to a be better place when you're 10 instead of 15 or 15 instead of 20, it continues to help you. It's not just the earliest childhood years that matter. Throughout childhood, growing up in a better area leads to better outcomes. Okay, so in light of that finding, let's now transition from that research base to thinking about how we can actually increase upward mobility by changing policies. And I really think that there are two different strategies that one might think about. One you might think of as a moving to opportunity approach. We spend about $45 billion a year in the US on providing affordable housing. It turns out most of that affordable housing is currently in relatively low opportunity areas. So one approach might be to try to provide more affordable housing in higher opportunity places. A different approach is to recognize you can't possibly move everyone and solve this problem, that there's a limit to the scalability of that. And so you also want to think about place-based investments. How do you turn the red colored parts of the map more blue, what can you do to increase upward mobility in low opportunity areas? So let me talk about each of those in a little bit more detail. Starting with the moving to opportunity approach. And so I'm first gonna start with a concrete example of how we're working with the Housing and Urban Development Agency and housing authorities around the country to implement this sort of strategy. So what we're showing you here is a snapshot from the Opportunity Atlas of data in Seattle, similar to what I showed you in Portland. You see lots of variation in Seattle uh, with rates of upward mobility in the center of the city much lower than in surrounding areas and so forth. Now the black dots that you're seeing on this map show you the most common locations where families receiving housing choice vouchers from the government currently live. And what you can see is that these dots are mostly concentrated in the more red or orange colored parts of the map. They're not in the blue colored parts of the map. And so that raises a natural question. Could you potentially help these families use the vouchers that they're getting from the government to move to higher opportunity areas? And in particular, we think there are a number of areas that could be opportunity bargains in some sense, places like Shoreline or Northgate in Seattle, which are actually just as affordable as the places where voucher holders are currently living but offer kids much better chances of climbing the income ladder. So we're not asking families to move to Bellevue or a place that would be completely unaffordable to a family with a housing voucher. We think there are lots of these opportunity bargains to be found in Seattle, in Portland, many other places around the country. And so motivated by that fact, we're collaborating with the Seattle Housing Authority uh, to run a pilot project that we're calling Creating Moves to Opportunity which intends, which is currently being run in Seattle and it's helping families with housing vouchers move to high opportunity areas in Seattle using three approaches. First, giving tenants simple information about these opportunity bargain areas, you know, driving them to those places, giving them education that, you know, here's a place you could afford to live where your kids would do much better. Second, on the landlord side of the market, recruiting landlords to participate in this program um, and lease their apartments to, to families with uh, housing vouchers, giving them some incentives to do so, an insurance fund and so forth. And then offering families housing search assistance, actually helping them get to these places uh, and, and find housing in these areas. And we're finding based on preliminary data that this is incredibly effective, that you're really able to help families move to these uh, different neighborhoods. And importantly, without significant additional costs to taxpayers, we're using the housing vouchers that HUD is already allotting to these families, we're just using that money more efficiently, which is I think the type of kind of win-win solution that we should be looking for. How can we spend the billions of dollars that we're already spending on these problems more effectively? And this is I think an important example of that. Now when we think about moving to opportunity, it's not just through the voucher program. Let me give you another example that I think is very salient. In this case, we are overlaying uh, the location of low-income housing tax credit developments, so LIHTC financed properties, affordable housing, uh, 
in Portland on the map that I showed you before. And what you can see here is LIHTC properties tend to be concentrated in pretty high poverty, low opportunity areas, partly because of the incentive structure of that program. So, you know, you might be concerned here that we're essentially incentivizing developers to build affordable housing in areas that offer relatively poor prospects of, uh, for, for kids to climb the income ladder. And that, again, I think creates an important policy opportunity to think about. Maybe we want to have more light tech development in the bluer colored parts of the map. Now, the, the presumption, I think, in designing the light tech policy in this way is that by having more building of affordable housing in these areas, perhaps you would revitalize those communities. And so that naturally leads to the second approach that I think is very important to think about, which is how can we actually improve low opportunity neighborhoods? Moving ultimately is never going to be a solution by itself. You know, what can we do to improve the areas that are in the red colors on the map? And so as a first step to, to answering that very complicated question, I'm going to describe the characteristics of high opportunity areas so you have a sense of the types of things I think we should be focusing on. So we've looked at a wide variety of different factors that predict these differences in upward mobility across places. And what we found distilling that analysis is that there are really four major factors that predict these differences. The first is that places that have higher levels of upward mobility tend to have lower poverty rates. So that's intuitive. They tend to have better resources, et cetera. You know, there are lots of reasons you might think living in a place with less poverty leads to higher upward mobility. Second, in a different vein, we find very strong correlations with measures of family structure. In particular, neighborhoods with more two-parent families have substantially higher rates of upward mobility. And in particular, for boys, you see much better outcomes in areas where there are more fathers present. Third, you see that areas with greater social capital. So will someone else help you out even if you're not doing well? How cohesive is the community? Those types of places like in Eastern Oregon, for instance, which is thought to have a lot of social capital, those types of places tend to have higher levels of uh, social mobility. And finally, as you might expect intuitively, the education system, both at the K through 12 level and in higher education, plays a really central role in driving differences in upward mobility. Now, I think all of these factors are extremely important, and it's important to dig into more detail on each of them and thinking about potential interventions. In the last couple of minutes, I'm going to show how you can use these types of data to drill down further into the education sphere to illustrate some of the other work we're doing on these issues. And so in particular, we've got an initiative that we're calling CLIMB, Collegiate Leaders in Increasing Mobility, which is a partnership between our group and 300 colleges around the United States that seeks to help colleges increase access to qualified low-income students and maximize the success of students from low-income backgrounds. And so what I'm going to do is show you a little bit of data from Oregon uh, that I think sheds light on how interventions in the educational system, higher education in particular, in Oregon could potentially be quite important as a pathway to increasing upward mobility in the state. So let me start with this chart here, uh, which shows you the uh, income distribution of the parents of students at the University of Oregon. And so what you're seeing here is what fraction of students uh, at the University of Oregon come from families earning less than $25,000 a year on the far left to more than $111,000 a year, the top 20% on the far right. And what you can see here is that the University of Oregon has a much larger share of students coming from very high income families versus students from uh, very low income families. Only 4.7% of students at the University of Oregon come from families in the bottom 20% of the income distribution. Now to get a sense for you know, what that looks like, it's useful to compare the major state schools in Oregon to other state schools in Arizona, California, and Washington, and so forth. And what you can see from this chart is if we look at the fraction of students from the bottom 20%, it's 4.7% of the University of Oregon, as I said before. It both OSU and U of O, it's significantly lower than the comparable figures that you see in the Washington system, Arizona State, UC Berkeley, UC Riverside, and so forth, which serve a much larger fraction of low-income students. Now, what's powerful about the data we're working with is that not only can we look at the parent incomes of all the students who attend different colleges in the United States, as I've been doing here, you can also look at students' earnings outcomes after they graduate, which of course is critical in understanding mobility, right? You need to look at who's going into the colleges, but then also how they're doing when they come out.
And so what you can see in this chart here now is looking at that same set of schools, but asking what fraction of students who came from a low-income family in the bottom quintile end up reaching the top fifth. And so you can see at U of O in Oregon State, that's about 30% of kids who start out in the bottom fifth make it to the top fifth. At other UC schools in the University of Washington system, you're seeing a higher rate of social mobility among those low-income kids. So now, last point, put these two things together, the set of kids who are coming in and their earnings outcomes, and you can form what we call a mobility rate. Take 100 students in a college and ask what fraction of them started out in a low-income family and ended up earning a lot, ended up in the top quintile. Okay, so think of that as what fraction, in some sense, uh, experienced the American dream at that institution. And you can see that the Oregon State schools relative to the UC schools and the Washington schools rank significantly lower in these mobility measures. And that's for a very simple reason. It's because they have significantly fewer low-income students to begin with. So what that analysis suggests, you know, at a very rough level, is that thinking about how to improve access to schools like OSU and University of Oregon, which have quite good outcomes in the broad spectrum, how, how do you improve low-income access, I think is a very important challenge to think about. It's a challenge that people at these schools are taking seriously and have done really interesting work on in the past few years, and we'd be delighted to partner, and we are partnering through the CLIMB initiative, working with those schools to evaluate the impacts of those recent interventions. But I think there's more to be done there. So let me end uh, by just concluding and pointing, pointing your way to a session that my colleagues will be running uh, this afternoon that focuses on taking these more academic or research lessons that I've presented here and talking about how we can translate that research to actual policy change with partnership with you on the ground. So there's gonna be a breakout session this afternoon led by David Williams, who's the policy director of Opportunity Insights, and my colleague Sabi devlin Fultz, who's a policy associate, uh, really focused at a more granular level on determinants of opportunity in Oregon and potential policy changes. And I wanna emphasize that all of us really welcome your ideas and look forward to partnering with you on these issues, and thanks so much uh, for your time. Thank you, Dr. Chetty. We're very excited about the, the partnership between Opportunity Insights and the Oregon Business Plan, and hope you'll join the breakouts on this topic later this afternoon.